We'll start with introductions. I'm Vaughn Bryan, Executive Director of Metropolitan Peace Initiatives. I uh, manage the Communities Partnering for Peace program for the city of Chicago. Um, my name is Miguel Angel Cambra. I work with Ready Chicago um, at Heartland Alliance. Um, I'm the Director of Career Pathways for Ready Chicago, and my primary role is sort of engage partnerships um, to sort of invest into the population that we're trying to serve. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rick Estrada. I'm President and CEO of Metropolitan Family Services. Good afternoon. My name is Ernest Cato. I'm the commander of the 15th District Chicago Police Department of the proud Austin neighborhood. Good afternoon. Tenny Cross. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Please sit down. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm the executive director of the Institute for Nonviolent Chicago, which works in Austin with Garfield and Back of the Yard, and our founding partners. I'm going to start with Miguel to talk about uh, your knowledge about what happened in Philadelphia and Oakland. So part of the experience that we, in learning of best practices in both out of Philadelphia and Oakland is understanding how to engage um, neighborhoods, participants, workforce, and, and cities to sort of work together to address pervasive gun violence. So Red Chicago was born from um, those sort of initiatives on a national level to inform us in Chicago of how to integrate through collaborative partnerships that involve various stakeholders in addressing pervasive gun violence um, in a city like Chicago. And Tinny, if you can talk about uh, Boston and LA and your knowledge about what they did just high level. So in, in Boston, like any other cities in the late 80s and early 90s, we had the crack epidemic. We had the end of a cycle of many people leaving neighborhoods and as well as factories leaving, so unemployment, and it was an explosion of violence. And we stumbled into partnering between law enforcement, probation, outreach workers, and clergy, really out of failure. None of those groups liked each other, but we were all meeting at funerals. So we kind of, out of necessity, we started working together. Uh, some people call it a Boston miracle. It still is a great example of violence reduction. Some of this model then was replicated in other places. The deputy mayor now of Chicago for violence reduction, uh, Susan Lee, is a proud example uh, with who worked on LA. If it's possible in LA, it's possible everywhere. Uh, we took that model then in Providence, Rhode Island, a very progressive new chief after previous mayor went to jail. Similar issues you're familiar with and really reformed what was going on there to the point it's a smaller place, but was very, very poor. Then in 2016, there was zero gang homicide. So this model works uh, in many other places. I think we're trying to structure together now something that will work for Chicago. And, and Commander Cato, from a police perspective, when you think about cities that have had like a similarly situated like New York and LA, what from a police perspective did the police do to reduce violence uh, in those cities? Well, I, tell you, I have been fortunate to go to go other cities. One of the biggest things is collaboration with community organizations and also empowering the communities to, to assist the police department. Uh, another issue is technology. Technology has played a huge role in policing communities. We've been fortunate that we uh, actually have a few uh, rooms in, our, in the department right now where we're doing our spot shotters our uh, pod missions, which is video. But I think the most important part of it is the collaborations with community workers and uh, outreach workers. Excellent. So Rick, if you could talk about like the history of violence prevention work, you know, kind of going back to Irv Spurgle in Chicago and talk about how we got to the point we are today. Wow, that's, a, that's a, could be a long story. I'll just be as brief as possible. You know, outreach work, community-based outreach work is not new in this city. It didn't start in L.A. or Boston, those places. We've been doing it here for about 100 years, if not uh, longer than that. I know that uh, I'll, I'll just begin from around the 1970s, 80s, and into the 90s. Uh, among the leading thinkers of that work was a guy named Irving Spurgle out of the University of Chicago that created uh, the street outreach model. Uh, he worked uh, extensively with the Department of Justice and with other universities to create best practices around uh, outreach. Many of the workers that are active today have come from that model. That model, I think some people might take offense to this, but I think it evolved uh, and took some turns. Then Gary Slumpkin at, um, you know, uh, Cure Violence kind of re-configured kind of it 
and talked about it as a public health approach to violence. Uh, as you know, uh, it was a very successful effort across uh, many parts of the country and parts of the world, and to a certain extent here in Chicago, uh, by creating the interrupters and other outreach uh, initiatives. Uh, what I would say about that program is many, many of the people that are working in the organizations that you're going to learn about more today, whether it's uh, our partners through Communities Partner for Peace or Ready Chicago or, or CRED and some of the other programs have come through cure violence initiatives of the past. So for me, it's an evolution uh, that you know started 100 plus years ago. Then you know there's some lots of unnamed uh, heroes that have been involved uh, certainly uh, over the 60s and 70s, and then later in, a, in an effort to professionalize it, Spurgo came to mind, and then other researchers and implementers that we're going to hear about today. And then Ready Chicago was sort of on a parallel track uh, being planned at the same time. Uh, Miguel, if you could kind of talk about how that evolved to where we are today. I, I don't know about the evolution of, of Ready in collaboration with everyone here. I think I look across this panel, everybody's still a part of Ready. And it's funny because we're at a moment in time in Chicago, um, and I've heard Tony say this before, like th the shift is happening of collaborative efforts. And I think in, in today's age, you can't say you're doing a, a violence intervention initiative without saying collaboration is a part of that. So everybody here on the stage is a part of Ready Chicago, in addition to folks that are not on the stage. And Ready Chicago, as you mentioned, um, as the strategies were happening in 2016 of what do we do different citywide, um, Ready Chicago was sort of sprout from that as well, which is an intense sensitive workforce initiative to look at cognitive behavioral therapy in addition to work skill building and job placement as a part of that. And it's probably the first um, sort of program in the country to do it for two year time frame um, in collaboration with local partners. So the strategy for Ready isn't that there is one institution leading the effort. There's sort of a funding stream that goes through co-collaboration with Heartland Alliance in addition to the pioneering of local agencies at the outreach side and at the workforce development. Side. So, Commander Cato, so given sort of the history of street outreach and different violence prevention initiatives, kind of talk about how the police have evolved in their work in partnership with uh, these organizations. Wow, you know, that's a very interesting one because if you think about in the past, the police department has tried in the past to have a relationship with outreach workers and it didn't work. Early on, it did not work. Uh, and to be totally transparent, I was very apprehensive at the very beginning to have that type of relationship. But what I did, I found a lot of trust in the Institute of uh, Nonviolence with uh, Tenny Gross and other organizations. So after we formed that relationship, and the department is going that way based upon the new administration, they want more collaboration, cooperations with outside organizations. What we learned in the 15th district, we developed a group called the Austin Response Team. We call it an art because it is an art. And on that team, there sits five outside organizations on that team, and Institute sits on that organization, Build sits on that organization, Hope Community Coach, Church, uh, Austin coming together and Stop the Violence. And I'm happy to say, since we formed that organization approximately two years ago, we've seen an incredible reduction in violence. Uh, just at to today's date, we have a 14% decrease in homicides and a 30% decrease in shootings. On top of that, if we go back to 2016, which was our worst year, you know, at this particular, two years later, we're looking at a 56% 50, reduction in person shot and an approximately 30% reduction in homicides. Now, I don't contribute that to just the work of the Chicago Police Department. It's because of the collaborative efforts. One thing I've learned, I could pick any street in the city of Chicago, and I'll tell you right now, I can clean that block up. The problem is, is when the police leave, who's going to sustain it? And what we found, the community organization has had the ability to sustain those blocks. But most importantly, when we identify gang conflicts, we contact our partners from the Institute and say, this is what we have in this particular area. How can you help us? The Institute then takes their resources, their outreach workers. Now, mind you, these workers are probably had caused some of the problems that exist today. Who better to go out there and solve some of these problems? And we've been very fortunate that they have been able to do that. Then we look at our partners who have the ability to reach out to children, which is our foundation, which is the most important part of this piece that we need to address. Because too often, we treat them as though they're invisible. We treat gang members as though they're invisible. And guess what? If you treat anything like it's invisible, you're going to get what we're getting today. So today, with the collaborative effort, 
with these community organizations, they've been able to address those issues. So Tenny, so given you're an implementer of both CP4P and Ready, and you have a strong collaboration with the police, kind of talk about it from the practitioner's perspective and all of the different elements in CP4P and Ready and how you guys engage with the police. It's going to come sort of from some humility that outreach alone or us alone uh, won't save it. When I was 23 driving in Dorchester in Boston, I really feel, felt this city is sleeping because of me. That would be defined by psychiatrists as megalomania. Uh, <laughs> and as you fail and you bury people and you see other people's contribution, you come to a place where you enjoy other people what they do, right? And really, Austin, we chose Austin because it led the city f forever in amount of shootings and homicides. And having the luck to have Commander Cato, having the luck of having the investments of CP4P and, and Rick's and Vaughn's leadership and having the investment of Ready, the fact that outreach, it would take us another 10 years to build a relationship that we sped up through having an opportunity of 18 months employment plus six months, right? So really bringing the, a lot of the problem in our city uh, and acute in Chicago is the disinvestment, right? So this framework here helps we can be a little connector with a finger in the dike, but there's all these things behind it that are bringing our resources. And that is really, so none of us should think we are the solution. We're really one safety net, and now we can connect and be connected to things that are really solving problems for us. I don't know how to solve housing for young people, or so many of them are homeless, but Heartland is working on it hard. MFS is working on mental health. These are resources beyond our reach, but through us we can connect people to solutions. So I'm feeling hopeful, and that is because big and small are working together. Well, what an inspiring and a difficult conversation. Uh, first of all, thank you, Vaughn, Miguel, Rick, Ernest, and Tenny for this discussion, and the good work that every one of you does every single day with your organization in our community. So thank you again for all of you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>